building self-esteem and self-confidence. Advice from Brian Tracy You become what you think about most of the time, Emerson once observed, in his strangest secret of success. Earl Nightingale stated simply that you become what you constantly think about. We have discovered that our outer environment just mirrors or correlates with our inner universe. The phrase garbage in, garbage out is used in computer language. However, it also denotes a positive flow. Now, if humans were like animals, with permanent programming that prevented us from altering our inclinations and behaviors, then there would be no chance for us. The good news is that we can undo all we've learned, that all of the programming that has been implanted in us can be erased and replaced with new programming. First, we assert that your subconscious mind's master program is your self-concept. It is a master's degree program. Your operating system is your sense of who you are. Your self-concept influences, modifies, and determines everything you produce on the outside. Without modifying your operating system, you cannot alter what is created on the outside. That is the first thing we are aware of. Second, we assert that your actions are always a reflection of your inner thoughts. Your behavior is always a reflection of your inner thoughts. There are laws now. According to the law of believing, your learned your beliefs shape who you are. However, what you believe might not actually be true. However, if you truly believe them, they will come to pass for you. According to the law of attraction, you attract people and circumstances into your life that are in harmony with your own thoughts. Your thoughts can be positive or negative, uplifting or depressing, but regardless of how you feel about them, you will draw similar individuals and situations into your life. According to the rule of expectation, expectations often turn into self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, things usually turn out the way you anticipate them to. And if you have erroneous expectations because of inaccurate information, then that's what will happen. Your expectations, for example, can be that you are destined to lead a remarkable life and achieve great achievement. The fact is that no matter what occurs, it is all a part of your learning process, which is inexorably bringing you enormous success, happiness, and achievement. And over time, if it is your fundamental conviction and something you fully anticipate to be true, it will come to pass. You'll be able to ignore life's ups and downs. You'll be able to block off the harmful influences in your environment. You will undoubtedly succeed if you expect it with confidence. Regardless of what people say, you simply respond, well, it'll be okay. Everything will be fine in the end. And we are aware that a disposition of self-assured expectancy is a sign of successful individuals. Simply put, they hope to succeed more often than fail. They anticipate that they will be disliked less frequently than they will be loved. They anticipate that every setback will teach them something. They anticipate continuing to advance. They simply anticipate it with confidence, and surprise, surprise, your realities are impacted by your assumptions. The way you think internally affects what you encounter externally. You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are, as the saying goes. According to the Bible, as a man thinketh in his heart, which refers to his deeply subconscious thinking, so is he. It's been done to you in accordance with your faith, and so forth. The third problem is that you don't trust what you see. You believe what you see. Regardless of whether the information is founded on erroneous information or not, you only see what you have already made up your mind to believe. To challenge your self-limiting ideas is one of the best rules, and one of the most crucial of all concepts. You know, we are all tormented by self-limiting beliefs, things we tell ourselves to keep ourselves back, and thoughts that confine us. We aim for our own feet and then congratulate ourselves on our accuracy. We restrict ourselves by holding self-contradictory views. We constantly tell ourselves that we have limitations, even though this is probably not true at all. The truth is that, in terms of potential, you have so much potential that, even if you ran at 100 miles per hour for the rest of your life, using all of your potential, you would never catch up, far away from what you're actually capable of. In fact, the great metaphysician Ernest Holmes famously remarked that the fundamental cause of all negativity is the unrealized potential. People believe they are far more capable than they actually are. Our major dilemma is not that we feel that we are powerless, but that deep down inside we know that we are powerful beyond measure, Nelson Mandela declared in his speech to the Nobel Prize Committee when he got his award. I've never met somebody more powerful than you, in every way. It's a wonderful idea. Isn't that thought almost unsettling? But it's also true since you have incredible powers. We routinely live within our means, as William James noted. We consistently waste the vast potential reserves that we possess. We now arrive at number 4. An improvement in your self-concept is the first step in improving any aspect of your performance. A better self-concept and more positive self-beliefs are the foundation for all changes in personal performance in what you do on the outside. Additionally, by altering your internal self-perception, you can alter the external reality of your existence. The fifth point is that self-concept and performance are related. Your levels of performance and effectiveness in whatever you do are determined by your self-concept. Always put your own self-concept first. As within, so without is the rule. 
It always starts inside and spreads from there. For years, people have been told that the average person only uses 10% of their potential. The typical person barely utilizes 10% of their ability. Etc. Then someone informed me that if that number were accurate, 90% of your potential would go unrealized. Let's keep things straightforward. It suggests that you are making around one-tenth of what you could be making. To put it another way, you could likely earn 10 times as much as you do now. We all know that it is true that you could make 10 times as much money as you do now. Then why do, do we have proof of that? Because a large number of people do it. Many people your age are engaged in it. Many folks who are doing it have nothing to begin with. There are a lot of people doing it in your field. It is thus obviously feasible. You may claim that it is a coincidence if there is just one American making 10 times as much as you do. But there are thousands, millions, even, of them. So perhaps we should admit that something is going on. You can do anything that anyone else has accomplished. You can study whatever anyone else has learned to get from where they were to where they are. Stanford estimates that the numbers are a little worse than 10%, but that is to be expected. According to Stanford, the typical person only utilizes around 2% of their potential. The ordinary individual has a lot of potential, but they are holding onto it for an as yet unknown good cause. We also know that your self-concept and how much of your potential you use are directly related. And since the average person's income is, let's take a generous estimate of 10%. If your self-concept is far more constrained than it should be, your degree of effectiveness will also be constrained. Furthermore, we are aware of the subjectivity of your self-concept. To put it another way, what you think, feel, and believe about yourself are not grounded in reality or in actual events. It is founded on facts that you have learned and considered as true. It has consequently come to pass for you. Most of our self-limiting ideas lack any kind of foundation. Can you play the violin? You may inquire of an adult in actuality. He or she will reply, No, I don't play the violin. A child will respond, I don't know, I haven't tried yet, if you ask them. The grown-up shoots oneself in the foot very, very quickly. Adults' eyes are wide open. The youngsters, like the instructor asks, Bobby, what are you doing, to the young Bobby? Well, I'm drawing a picture of God, he says. You can't do that, she argues, because no one knows what God looks like. Yeah, well, when I'm done, they will. In other words, they lack certain building blocks. We now claim to be mature and old. Do you understand what it means to be elderly, older, more mature, and wise? It indicates that we betrayed ourselves. We made a compromise. We bury our aspirations, as they say. We are aware of our limitations, and whenever we can, we'll try to persuade as many other people to share our viewpoint. We now know that your self-concept influences your performance and that it is arbitrary. Consider that. You believe that you lack competence in a particular area of your life. You believe your revenue is constrained. It is arbitrary. Let me now clarify what I mean to you. Each of us has a number of smaller self-conceptions. Your sense of style is part of your self-concept. Additionally, you have an idea of how effectively you talk in public, tell jokes, and play an instrument. You also have an idea of how timely you are, how efficiently you manage your time, how much you read, and whether you listen to audiobooks in the vehicle. You have an idea of who you are as a person, including your intelligence, creativity, learning capacity, and memory. You have an idea of who you are as a person and how likable you are to other people. If you work in sales, you likely have a self-concept or a smaller version of yourself for each of the various aspects of selling. Examples include prospecting, approaching, interrogating, presenting, and responding to objections over the phone, finally, and so forth. Your total self-concept as a salesperson is made up of a variety of tiny, individual self-concepts that when placed all together, you have an idea of the type of spouse or parent you are, as well as the type of child you were to your parents. What sort of a lover are you? How much you drink? What kind of drinker you are? And how much you weigh? You have an idea of yourself that you are polite. Every aspect of your life that you value has a self-concept for you. Then have a self-concept for driving, incidentally. All guys believe themselves to be superb drivers. By the way, ladies, this is a genetic issue. We possess a previously unknown additional chromosome that makes us exceptional drivers. By the way, you can know when your self-concept is being questioned. You immediately react badly because of your own assumptions about yourself. You resemble your mother exactly. You never arrive on time. When anything conflicts with who you think you are, you respond defensively and furiously. It comes naturally. You have what are referred to as triggers, and someone can simply push you to start you. Men can thus always drive safely. And any woman who has ever had to correct a man's driving knows that we don't take it well. By the way, women pride themselves on having good manners. Women are fantastic at having good manners. Women essentially keep society together because they are so aware of how things should be done. Moreover, even if a woman is dressed and she will never forget the time you accused her of having bad manners while she was wearing rags, being covered in mud, hurling dishes, and shouting. Here's the revelation that changed my life in terms of my self-concept many years ago. 
I found it hard to believe. I stumbled as I stood there. I can still recall where and when I first learned it many years ago, is that each of us has an idea of how much money we make, and that you can never earn more than 10% above or below your idea of how much money you make without participating in compensatory activities. Your self-concept functions like a thermostat and has a zone known as the comfort level. You strive to enter your comfort zone because your self-concept is based on your degree of income. Additionally, we are aware of two aspects of human psychology. We aim to enter a comfortable state and maintain there. And we will fight against any change that may even beneficial change that pushes us outside of our comfort zone. Second, we will find it difficult to return to and re-establish our comfort zone if it is forced upon us for any length of time. Has anyone ever been somewhere for two or three weeks? You know, when you move away and rent a condo, the first thing you do is head to the grocery store and stock up on all the same foods you left behind. Sometimes you bring your own coffee cup, and we bring our kids toys, blankets, and pillows. To put it another way, we relocate and develop a new comfort zone. Consequently, we are aware of your income. What you can make today has nothing to do with what you can make tomorrow. Your current level of comfort is the only factor. If your income is 10% or more over your self-perceived level, you'll start acting and compensating, or throw away, ways right away. You exert every effort to get rid of the money. By the way, this is the reason you hear so much about drug dealers. They'll literally lose it on the street after leaving a briefcase stuffed with cash in a taxi. They simply lose the money because they know deep down that it is so much more than they can ever imagine. They simply move on. You start acting scrambly if your income drops by 10% or more from where you perceive it to be. You put in more hours and effort, pursue further training, and develop an interest inside employment and second source of money. Afterward, you remain in your comfort zone once you've gotten there. In actuality, your comfort zone is roughly 40% lower than the amount you truly in need of consolation at this time. It's fundamental research. People have asked how much money you need to make a comfortable living on your current salary. They claim that people generally spend 40% more than I consider to be reasonable. But after that, that would grow to be your default setting. What would the answer be if the question was posed in a year? 40% more. No matter how much money you make, you merely change your comfort level. When I discovered this, I understood that I could improve my income if I could raise my temperature or my financial thermostat, and that marked the pivotal moment. In the following five years and ten years after that, it allowed me to grow my salary ten times. And when I told a lot of individuals about the concepts we're discussing today, they all responded in the same way. Absolutely amazing. No matter how hard you work on the outside, if you don't modify your comfort zone and self-concept on the inside, which is what we will talk about doing and what we are talking about doing throughout this course, nothing will change. We now know that your self-concept is composed of these three components. Your ideal self is part of the sentence. Your self-ideal is made up of your objectives, values, aspirations, traits that you admire in others and in yourself, as well as your hopes, desires, and visions. Here's a crucial element, though. These are your this is the person you would like to be in the ideal world, someday. Your ideal has a significant impact on the course you take in life and what you do today to ensure that you get there tomorrow. We know that the key word in this sentence is clarity, and I could write a whole day about it. People that are successful have a very clear sense of who they are, where they're going, what they want to do, and what they want to achieve, because of their clarity, which functions almost like a magnet to attract them toward making decisions, their desire into reality. Therefore, it is more probable that you will move quickly toward your objectives and that those goals will move more quickly toward you the more clarity you have about who you are and what you would ideally like to be, have, and do sometime in the future. We know from experience that those who are unsuccessful have very hazy aspirations. In the majority of cases, they lack all ideals. They compromise any ideals they might have. They lack any visions or objectives. Additionally, if something else emerges and moves in either of those directions, successful people have a clear vision and move steadily in the direction of their goals. They strive to be the best versions of themselves, things that they envision accomplishing. Your ideal of yourself is therefore crucial. The second is how you view yourself. The way you think and feel about yourself constitutes your self-image. You may refer to it as your internal mirror. It affects how you carry yourself in public. It's as though you check yourself in this mirror before performing. When you work and interact with clients, you will be as you envision yourself, an amazing sales professional, calm, confident, relaxed, positive, and highly paid. It will be obvious if you consider yourself to be new, inexperienced, and lacking in product knowledge. But what matters is what is happening internally. And with self-image alteration, we know that if you alter your mental images, if you start visualizing and imagining yourself as you would like to be, your subconscious mind will accept that mental picture as a blueprint or directive, and you will act on the outside in accordance with the mental picture, 
Here's a crucial tip. If you have an important event coming up, visualize and see yourself calm, confident, relaxed, and envision the situation turning out wonderfully every time you think about it. The final thing you consider before going to sleep the night before a big day is to envision and give your mind images of you performing at your absolute best. Your subconscious mind then works with that image in the lab, working on it all night. You'll discover that you perform flawlessly when you get out and enter that position the following morning or day. All elite athletes and Olympic competitors utilize these methods frequently to train themselves, constantly seeing themselves performing at the highest level. Very significant. Your self-esteem is see your self-worth is actually at the center of everything right now. How you view yourself reflects your level of self-esteem. The foundation of your personality is your sense of self-worth. Your degree of energy is based on it. It establishes your personality type. High self-esteem individuals are likable and personable. With other folks, they get along nicely. They are pleased with themselves. They rarely get sick. They are quite energetic. In our society, those with strong self-esteem are the most wanted and attractive. High self-esteem and good self-responsibility are the two traits of high success in sales, and each one feeds the other. A person with high self-esteem accepts responsibility for their actions, and a person with high self-esteem accepts a high degree of responsibility. And how much you like yourself is the finest way to define self-esteem. How much you value your own opinion. How well you think of yourself as a husband, parent, salesperson, salesperson, man or woman, and how well you think of yourself as a person in general. In terms of your physical health and fitness, how much you value yourself in terms of your income, communication skills, sense of humor, and ability to get along with people, how much you value your own opinion. We also know that your total self-concept is an average of how you see yourself in all the key aspects of your life. We also understand that if you speak the words I like myself, you will become that which you think about. I genuinely like myself. Saying I like myself raises your general perception of who you are. Your levels of performance and effectiveness in every aspect of your life increase when your overall self-concept improves. The more you state, the more you say, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, the more successful you become. You like yourself more as you perform better. The better you perform, the more you'll like yourself. Self-mastery and self-efficacy are the antithesis of self-esteem. The more you accomplish, the more you like who you are. The more you do, the more you like who you are. Additionally, by telling yourself repeatedly, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, you improve your self-image and do better in all of your endeavors. Try it. Speak the phrase I like myself. I like who I am. When I initially learned about this, I reasoned that it couldn't be that easy. And yet I began repeating this 5, 10, 20, 50, or 100 times each day. I like who I am. 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 Such as a ninja. I believe I can. I believe I can. I am confident in my ability. I am confident in my ability. I like who I am. I like who I am. Here's an intriguing observation. You might not actually like yourself when you declare, I like myself, at first. Sometimes you feel a little silly inside when you first remark, I like myself. This was what I encountered. After further research in psychology, I discovered that when a new message is received, it can cause what psychologists refer to as cognitive dissonance, or the clashing of two symbols. If there is old junk in your subconscious mind that says you don't like yourself or that is critical or doubtful of yourself, the clang that follows the new old symbol is accompanied with an uneasy sensation. You feel uneasy and a little bit like a phony or imposter whenever you say something to yourself that is incongruous with outdated junk and makes you feel like it's not correct. But the phrase I like myself are flawlessly true and flawlessly good. And you perform better the more you like yourself. And if you keep telling yourself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, you penetrate your subconscious mind more and farther, growing to love yourself ever more. And ultimately it takes the place of all the previous damaging messages. Keep in mind that your subconscious mind only obeys your directions and does not reason for itself. Your subconscious mind is incredibly strong and its responsibility it to keep you in line with your inner dictates on the outside. Therefore, if you repeatedly say, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, your body language will alter. Your body will be adjusted by your subconscious mind, diction, your voice tone, and your handshake. Your responses and actions will be altered by it. You'll feel better about yourself, and you like other people more when you feel better about yourself. Additionally, people like you more when you like them more. Your life thus improves steadily. And everything we do ought to be geared at making us like ourselves more. Why is it that we want to excel in all we do? Because if you feel unqualified for your field, you will never be content and have a good sense of self-worth. Accepting mediocrity is the absence of a dedication to greatness. When you break into the top 10% of your industry, 
You are really proud of yourself. You have a positive self-image. People respect and admire you, look up to you, and seek you for guidance. Your superiors also respect and admire you, want to take you out to lunch, and your clients like you and want to do business with you. And you feel fantastic. Therefore we strive for excellence since doing so boosts and maintains our sense of self-worth. Your self-esteem cannot exist in a vacuum by itself. High self-esteem cannot exist in a vacuum from reality. You cannot have a strong sense of self-worth while acting badly and failing. Therefore what you do is consistently establish goals for yourself which raises your self-esteem because only those with great self-esteem do this. Thus the reversibility effect is a result of the very process of setting lofty goals. If you want to have high self-esteem you establish goals which makes you have high self-esteem. This is because people with high self-esteem set goals if the possessor their Therefore, we strive for excellence since doing so boosts and maintains our sense of self-worth. Your self-esteem cannot exist in a vacuum by itself. High self-esteem cannot exist in a vacuum from reality. You cannot have a strong sense of self-worth while acting badly and failing. Therefore, what you do is consistently establish goals for yourself, which raises your self-esteem because only those with great self-esteem do this. Thus, the reversibility effect is a result of the very process of setting lofty goals. If you want to have high self-esteem, you establish goals, which makes you have high self-esteem. This is because people with high self-esteem set goals. If the possessor high self-regard get along well with other people, then focus on doing so. Surprise, surprise, other people will treat you well and your self-esteem will increase. Every movement is backwards, forwards, windshield wiper. And your entire life needs to turn into a continuous process of enhancing your self-esteem in all areas of life that are significant to you. Additionally, you will achieve remarkable feats. It begins with the phrase I like myself. The phrase I like myself is the most effective in reinforcing one's self-concept, making it number seven. I like who I am. I love you. You're the most amazing kids in the world. You tell your kids when you inform your partner that they are. They prefer themselves more than the world's most wonderful person. They like you and themselves more now. You like them more if they like you more. By saying things to those around you that make them feel even better about and respect themselves even more, you can actually improve the quality of your interactions with them. Because whenever you do anything to make someone else feel better about themselves, you also feel better about yourself. Nature has created us in the most amazing way. You cannot make someone else feel better without making yourself feel better as well. The opposite is also accurate. It is impossible for us to act or speak negatively against another individual without doing the same to ourselves. The rose's scent clings to the hand that casts it, I wrote. Anything you cast has a scent that clings to your hand. 8. There are two significant barriers to excellent performance. The fear of failing is the first. Or when youngsters are repeatedly told, no, stop, they begin to develop a dread of failure. Don't escape that area. Don't touch that. No, stop, and no are the first words that children repeatedly hear. Children have an instinctive need to touch, smell, taste, and feel everything. They are little kamikaze flyers. Nothing at all gives them a sense of danger. And parents constantly work to keep youngsters safe by admonishing them to stop. No, leave that area immediately. Be silent about that. Put down that. Look at what you've done now. Children gradually start to feel the inability to do something if they are verbally, emotionally, or physically abused. I am too little. Mommy scolds me for trying something new every time. They become irate with me. At me, they shout. I simply cannot. I can't. And as adults, the first thing we say when presented with a fresh chance, a fresh prospect, a book, a CD, a course, a job, or a promotion is, I can't. I can't. Come over here and address the crowd. God help me, I can't. I can't. I can't. Just get up and explain how you arrived at your current position in life. 54% of adults would sooner perish than speak in front of others. I can't. Therefore, if you are presented with the chance to try something new, your default response, which forces you outside of your comfort zone, is I can't. Our solar plexus is where we always experience this failure fear. It begins in the solar plexus at the front of our bodies and goes up through the stomach to the heart, lungs, and throat. Can even give us migraines, lead to a loosened bladder, and require us to go to the restroom. It's awful how afraid we are of failing. And the way you combat the fear of failure is by saying the opposite of those words whenever you have a scared thought. I can do it, are the exact words. I can manage it. I can manage it. I can manage it. Say to your children, you can do it. Say to your partner, you can do it. Inform your friends that you can succeed. Encourage those who are considering a new venture by saying, you can accomplish it. Start your own company, you can do it. You can accomplish it, say to a significant consumer. Just tell others, you can do it. Because every time you give someone else encouragement, you give yourself encouragement as well. What do you mean by encourage? It is intended to inspire courage in. You truly encourage yourself when you support other people. 
Keep in mind that the main opponent is fear. Our task is to eliminate this fear of failing and this dread that impedes and paralyzes us. Imagine a world in which you had no fear whatsoever. What a change it would bring. Imagine having a guarantee of success in any endeavor. It's as if someone waved a magic wand over you and predicted your success in everything you do going forward. And when you came here, you had unlimited options. You'll be successful if you call on anyone, go anywhere, start anything, and try anything. Until we consider what we would do if we didn't have any fear. We are unaware of how important a role it plays in our lives. B is the dread of being rejected. The second major worry is the fear of rejection. Children learn when they are told to behave well or else. If you don't, you'll get into a lot of trouble. Parents remove their love and affection from the child and show their displeasure and anger at what the youngster does as a result of the current situation. The child craves love more than anything else and wants to get along with people. He or she also wants to be liked. Children therefore learn at a very young age that getting along with others requires doing the same. As a result, kids soon stop acting in ways that their parents disapprove and begin to utter the phrase I have to, I have to. I have to comply with mommy's wishes. I have to follow my father's wishes. They won't adore me if I don't follow their lead. After that, we reach adulthood. This also becomes unconscious and our subconscious minds have been programmed with it. And a lot of folks develop hypersensitivity. They are extremely sensitive to other people's viewpoints. They are very sensitive to other people's criticism. I must do this. I must complete that. He won't like me if I don't do this. I won't win her over. I won't win them over. They'll think poorly of me. We consequently develop hypersensitivity. We have a fear of criticism, which is a fear of rejection. It is a concern for mockery. It is a concern for rejection. And we discover that in order to advance in their lives, all successful people must conquer their anxieties of failure, criticism, and rejection. What then is the rebuttal to the statement I have to? I don't have to is the answer. No need for me to. I am free to engage in any activity I choose and am not required to do anything. We must start to define ourselves in our own terms because it is one of the most crucial things we can accomplish in life. You do what you do because you want to and because it is consistent with what you believe is best for your own life, to put it simply. And you avoid doing it or refrain from doing it because you're worried about what people will think. Because what other people may think is really pretty meaningless, since opinions change constantly and you cannot base your life decisions on them years ago. I read Edmund Rothstein's play Serrano de Bergerac. Serrano is a fantastic, fascinating man who exhibits extreme individualism and confidence in himself. They question him later in the book, or in the play, Serrano, asking, why have you always been so individualistic? You have always made your own decisions. You've always had no regard for other people's viewpoints. Well, I gave this a lot of thought when I was younger, and I came to the conclusion that other people's viewpoints were inconsistent and subject to change. Therefore, I made the decision to always do what would make me feel good about myself, at the very least. And you're aware of something. That's the highest level of reason since other people's opinions are as erratic and variable as the wind and weather. Ideally, please just yourself. When in doubt, ask yourself, what do I want to do? What do I, myself, truly want to do? Additionally, don't risk your life based on what you believe others might think. The truth is that you would be offended if you understood how little people really thought of you. Never risk your life out of concern for what you believe others may think. Why do so many individuals continue in unsatisfactory jobs and relationships? They are worried that if they leave, other people will be quite upset. And what ultimately makes its point where they turn around and say, well, I've left that job or that relationship because they can no longer take it any longer. And they respond, yes, I'm curious as to why you remained there for so long. Everyone has known for years that it wasn't functioning. And you believe that you put on a fantastic performance, really impressing everyone, even though everyone is aware of this. The next rule is as follows. First, I stated that people don't alter. Second rule, everyone is well versed in everything. You probably require counseling if you think that other people don't know everything. Everyone is aware of everything. And if they are unaware of something, someone will quickly inform them. The things I like about myself are therefore these. And here's the most fantastic thing. There is a direct correlation between how much you enjoy yourself and your anxieties of failing and being rejected have an inverse relationship to your self-esteem, which is on one escalator. The less you fear failure, the more confident you become. Rejection is a fear that decreases the more you like yourself. The fewer fears you have, the more self-aware you become. That being the case, when you say, I like myself, I like myself, and I can do it, I can do it, I am not required to do something I don't want to. When you speak kindly to yourself, you behave, feel, and think positively, in a positive way. How you say to yourself at any given time controls 95% of your emotions. If you use dynamic, productive, and positive self-talk, such as I like myself, the best is me, I adore what I do, 
Anything I set my mind to, I can accomplish. If you speak to yourself in that way, your confidence will grow and your fear levels will decrease. Your worries won't go away. But when you do experience them, you should face them head-on, mount a defense, and charge at them by first gaining control of your thoughts before engaging in the behavior that causes your anxieties. Until the fright has passed. Right. I'm good. The secret to great success is this. 9. There are two significant fear-based traps. Learned helplessness is the name of the first significant trap a serious mental disorder that affects 80% or more of Americans is learned helplessness. We feel powerless. We cannot alter. The weight cannot be lost. Our revenue cannot be increased. We are unable to manage our bills. We are unable to become financially independent. We aren't able to earn more, do more, sell more, or have more. We are unable to do anything. And it just occupies our thoughts so much. Then we start to adore our justifications. Our justifications become our true loves. In one of his works, Richard Bach once penned the following. Argue for your restrictions, and indeed, they are yours. Most of us present a case against ourselves in court, accuse ourselves of wrongdoing, and tell ourselves all the reasons we are powerless to accomplish our goals. However, the truth is that you are incredibly powerful and not at all powerless. That is accurate, right? Say yes. And if you hold that belief, it comes to pass for you. The safe zone is be the most dangerous place to be as in your comfort zone. We tend to fall into our comfort zones, and some people do so when they are still very young. In reality, recent years have seen some interesting research on age. You know, some individuals may tell you to close your eyes and read this. How old would you believe yourself to be if you didn't know your actual age? And you're aware of something. Your intellect mainly has no age. Your intellect does not age as your body does. You wouldn't be aware of your age if you were separated from your body. Amnesics have no memory of their past, including their age or anything else. And occasionally a 39-year-old will mistakenly believe they are 29, so they portray 29. Your comfort zone is therefore crucial. What age are you? They ask. Are you aware of your age? As ancient as your dreams are, you. Your aspirations and adaptability reflect your age. Your aspirations are as old as you. Additionally, there are those are 65 years old, vibrant, engaging, trying new things, learning how to use computers, and taking up activities like skiing, skydiving, and scuba diving. And there are 25-year-olds who are considered old because they have settled into a safe space. And they do things like defend themselves, backtrack, shovel, and so on. So, where do you feel most at ease? Get yourself out of your comfort zone and set bigger goals. And then let's speak about it, whatever it is. Broader objectives, aspirations, and visions. And you just ask yourself, why not me? Anytime you see someone else succeeding at something, I am capable of doing it. I could carry it out. I could carry it out. In conclusion, 10. Your desired outcome. To become unstoppable is your aim. How can you become unstoppable given that you are what you think about the majority of the time? You act by declaring, I am unstoppable. You catch yourself every time you want to stop and say, I am unstoppable, to yourself. Say it out loud, I am invincible. And every time you encounter any kind of challenge, you simply pause and declare, wait a minute, I'm unstoppable. I am unstoppable. I'll be all over you like fleas on a hound dog if you don't bring a 357 Magnum and fire the first shot right away if you try to stop me. I can do no wrong. For 30 days, I studied this and I've come to the conclusion that everything we've learned about the growth of character and personality peaks at being unstoppable. Being the kind of person that launches and won't stop until they absolutely achieve their goals. Right. Be invincible. Additionally, you'll persevere more if you like who you are. You are less inclined to give up the more you like who you are. And as you may know, we have discovered that those who persist eventually achieve significant success. People stopping is the main cause of underachievement is that there are no boundaries to what you can achieve if you are utterly clear about where you're going, utterly clear about who you are on the inside, and completely clear about what you want to achieve. You continue because you like who you are. But here's the most amazing thing. It takes a lot of self-control to do these things since every single psychological drive works to keep us from doing them. By persevering and using self-control to do so, you build up your self-control. Additionally, your propensity to persevere increases each time you exercise more self-control. Additionally, Every act of self-control and perseverance boosts your self-esteem because you come to appreciate and like yourself more for being the kind of person who didn't give up when others did. And when you feel better about yourself, you have more discipline and persistence. Therefore, as a conscious outcome of all of these attributes, which are acts and behaviors that you engage in, willpower. By chewing gum, you state, that's what I want. This is who I am, said gum. That's where I'm headed, by gum. Additionally, as you persist in your refusal to give up, you grow to appreciate yourself more and more, which decreases the likelihood that you'll ever give up. Eventually, you'll get to the point where others will remark, well, she will never give up. She will act on her promises to accomplish something. You can deposit that at a bank. He will not give up. He is not the type to give up easily. 
One thing I know about him is that once he decides to accomplish anything, he will never, ever quit. When you gain such a reputation, not only are you fantastic, not only is money success assured, but also your happiness, respect, and esteem in life and with those around you. Because you created yourself, molded yourself, and developed your own identity, you rose to the rank of one of the finest members of our society. Neither done to you nor with you, nor for you. You were the one who carried it out. Which helps you feel better about yourself, which encourages you to persevere even more. It improves your self-control. It increases your likability and personability. Additionally, which increases your success in all you do. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe.